can't believe I'm standing here talking to you. You're responsible for the greats. Let's do the list. Spider-Man. Guilty. The Incredible Hulk. Afraid so. Oh, man, this is so cool. The X-Men. Now that you mention it. Shit, man, you are a god. He loved telling stories so much that he hated giving interviews because he had to stop to listen to the journalist's questions. His biography is a puzzle in which you get lost, trying to figure out where is reality and where is another reality that he created. True believer Stan Lee was the god of the comics world, or just a universally recognized ambassador from Marvel. Why did they fall out with Steve Ditko? Whom did they work with side by side on the creation of Spider-Man? And is it true that without the timely advice of his wife Joan, the entire Marvel Universe could not exist at all? Today on the Biographer Channel, we will tell you about a man who has become a legend for all comic book fans. The one thanks to whom comics moved to a qualitatively different, higher level. The man whose long and productive life was full of vivid fictions and fantasies, sometimes contradictory, but always in his unique style. Everything about Stan Lee, starting with his own biography, is filled with the spirit of myth-making. What was Stan really like? Which facts from his biography are real and which are corrected by his imagination? In which of the interviews did he tell the truth and which one he openly made up a lie? Only Stan knows, and we can only guess, rely on the testimony of his contemporaries, draw our own conclusions from his work, and his own words. It's like the famous story about Lee's repeated victory in the New York Herald Tribune's literary competition in which he participated as a teenager. The competition invited its young readers to submit works about the events of the past week that were most significant to them. From the received works, seven were selected for the shortlist every week, and from them, one winner, who received a considerable cash prize of $20 for that time. According to Stan, as a 15-year-old, he won twice in a row, after which he was politely asked to stop and give others a chance. According to people who later researched the facts of his biography, they did not find a single winner named Stan Lee Martin Lieber in the newspaper archives. Only a single mention in the shortlist for 1938. But you know what? Let's look at such contrabances of Stan Lee from a different angle. Could a person, devoid of imagination and the desire to change the world, including his own, come up with so many other worlds and characters and those that did not even exist before? All his life, he worked not only on creating fantastic characters, but also on creating the very image of Stan Lee. He didn't want to be just the man behind the comics. He wanted to be the one associated with the masterpieces he created. This has always been his great goal, to leave his mark in this universe. What did Stan, the man, Lee, do? Neither more nor less, but simply by playing, he created a whole new universe for himself. The Marvel Universe, in which he was not just another nameless comic book author, but a god creator, the author of a whole modern mythology. Face front, true believers, under his slogan, he united millions of sincere followers of his Marvel cult. But simultaneously with the Marvel Universe, Stan created his own personal brand, the brand of great Stan Lee. Hey, Fandango fans, this is Stan Lee saying Excelsior. His slogan, Excelsior, the famous catchphrase, translated from Latin as Ever Upward, is his own password on the way to the top of fame, which readers first learned about from the pages of Marvel's bullpen bulletins, and which was printed in the memory of millions and became a kind of slogan of this brand. Even the way he looked, Stan was also creating his brand, using strengths and weaknesses to clearly stand out. He competently thought out his image as an ambassador of the Marvel brand. So, for example, his constant glasses and toupee. He had a whole collection of toupees. He started wearing them as soon as he realized he was starting to go bald, not wanting to seem like a young fan to his aging grandfather. This is how he created the image of a youthful Uncle Lee. The toupees were chosen so that by changing them one by one, Stan could create the illusion that his hair is growing. With age, they changed color, matching the gray hair and his famous dark glasses, through which he always looked at the world with a sly squint. In fact, over the years, Stan developed an eye problem caused by sensitivity to UV radiation, but as was typical of him, he turned a practical necessity into a symbol here. Later, when asked about the glasses, he just made up another story instead of admitting his human frailty. I've always worn sunglasses. They're like my mask, I guess. It was probably just some silly affectation. When I was very young, I just started off as a writer. I always lit a pipe and held it in my teeth as I wrote. I hated smoking a pipe, but I felt it made me look older and like a writer. I was 18. Sunglasses are better for your health. Even if you look at his personal life, re-watching and re-reading his interviews over the years, you'll come across at least three main, somewhat different versions of his romantic acquaintance with his charming wife Joan. 
Stanley Martin grew up with the desire to change every minute and second of his ordinary everyday life into something that was dreamed of, desired. From childhood, the boy saw his successful future, imagined himself at the top of the world and wanted people to see him exactly as he wanted to be remembered. As we can see, everything happened for real and his name is forever included in the lists of those who were not afraid to brightly and uniquely change our world and agree it is worth giving the great dreamer some indulgence because he deserved it. So if somewhere the facts about Stan do not match, or you heard something else, or we provided several versions at the same time, all questions to Stan, to the one who, like Doctor Strange, masterfully twisted reality around his finger, opening portals to other worlds. I was born of poor but humble parents. Stan Lee Martin Lieber's parents were Celia Solomon and Jack Lieber. Both of them were Jewish immigrants from Romania who had been forced to flee their home country due to the anti-Semitic policies of the Romanian government at the time, which were rapidly gaining momentum. The couple got married in 1920, and two years later, in December 1922, they had their firstborn, a boy named Stanley. It was this little one who, over the years when he grew up and began to confidently create his own worlds, took the sonorous name of Stan Lee for this important superhero mission, dividing the ordinary name Stanley into two parts. But for now, we will just call him Stanley, telling you about the early years of his life. When Stanley was born, the Lieber family lived in New York in a small apartment in Manhattan. His father worked as a tailor, and his mother raised children Stanley and the youngest Larry, who was born in 1931. Perhaps later the father would have built a better career and started to provide the family with a more prosperous life, but the country plunged into the Great Depression, depriving people of their dreams, driving them out onto the streets, forcing them to think only about a piece of bread. She did not miss the Stanley family either. The Liebers were forced to move to an even smaller apartment on Fort Washington Avenue, and later, after Larry was born, they moved to the Bronx. The boy forever remembered the empty and despairing look of his father when he sat at the table and just stared in front of him because he could not find a job and support his family decently. Although, at first, Jack did not give up. After losing his job as a pattern maker, he invested all his savings in the purchase of a diner, thinking that it would help him stay afloat. But the business soon went bankrupt and a constant search for at least some part-time job began. Because of hardship and uncertainty in the future, parents often quarreled. In general, Jack was quite emotionally detached from the boys. Mother, Celia, was quiet, gentle, but adored children, especially Stanley. Although the boy was probably not the easiest to raise because he was very smart, but until a certain time, he did not have much desire to delve into school life and preferred to spend more time with what was really interesting to him. He was more interested in his own fantasies, books, films, and radio shows. Being an adult and famous, Lee often mentioned his desire to escape in his childhood memories, either directly or indirectly, in long stories about happy days. Like, for example, his vivid memory of how he adored riding his bike through the streets of New York. When I wrote it, in my imagination, I was a mighty knight top a noble steed. He said that the bicycle was his best friend precisely because it gave him such a dreamy feeling of wings and freedom. On it, the boy could fly wherever he wanted, both literally and in his imagination, forgetting about his despairing father and upset mother. However, there was something that interested him in school. Actually, it was not something, but someone. School teacher Leon B. Ginsburg, who was just 10 or a little more years older than Stanley. This teacher was so memorable to Lee that he even later mentioned him in his autobiographical book Excelsior, The Amazing Life of Stan Lee. Do you remember the name of your elementary school teacher? Stanley remembered. Why? Because Mr. Ginsburg gave the little dreamer Stanley a real magic wand in the form of a kind of revelation awareness, with the help of which the boy was later able to make his dreams come true. This magic wand was humor, which the young teacher incredibly artistically wove into his classes. He first made me realize that learning could be fun, that it was easier to reach people, to hold their attention, to get points across with humor than any other way. But let's return to the world of Stanley's fantasies, to what fascinated and stimulated his imagination. For some time, the boy played in the theater group of the local synagogue, where he studied the basics of drama using biblical stories as an example. And also, it was just fun transforming into someone else, and it was another means of escaping from reality. But the biggest hobby was books and movies. The cinematography was especially mesmerizing, although it was not a frequent pleasure. In those days, I could only go to about one movie a month just because of the price. It was a big event when I would go to a movie. Luckily, I could read a book at any time, so I did a lot of that. Stanley's favorite actor was Errol Flynn, 
The boy literally adored him because he always played some kind of heroic role, an honest and brave sheriff, Robin Hood or Captain Blood. The boy even dreamed of being similar to him in some way, to put a crooked smile on his face, to check whether the sword was firmly fixed in the scabbard, and to go in search of some young damsel in distress, to save her from rude hooligans and thereby conquer her heart. This was all Stan. Even then, he didn't want to be one of the many. He had to stand out, be different, do something to be noticed. Already in high school, making an entry in the yearbook, he wrote, reach the top and stay there. This was his goal, to which he had been steadily moving since childhood. But so far, he could only dream. Due to the constantly tense atmosphere at home caused by his parents' quarrels, the boy was looking for something in which he could immerse himself and be far from reality. The main and most accessible hobby was reading. I don't remember what age I started reading at. I think I was born reading. I mean, I can't remember a time when I wasn't reading. And my mother used to say that, um, well, when I ate, I had to have something to read. If she gave me breakfast or lunch or dinner, in fact, one of the first gifts they ever bought me was a reading stand, a little stand to prop up on the table so I could rest a book against it while I ate. And she used to say if I didn't have a book to read, I'd read the label on a ketchup bottle. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what a, I, I was no genius. I'm sure I started reading when any kid did, but, but I loved reading. I really did. Besides books and movies, there was a whole separate world in those days, the world of radio. There was no television yet, and its place was occupied by wooden boxes of receivers from which, besides music, contests and quizzes, there were radio performances and radio shows with comedians performing and actors reading books. It was really a whole world that could not be seen, but could be heard, and that was what encouraged the imagination to work. Stanley was particularly fond of The Chase and Sanborn Hour, which aired from 1929 to 1948 and featured the biggest stars of that time. The boy's favorite was Edgar Bergen, because even then Stanley felt the melody of speech and adored short and apt lines, sharp, ironic humor. He liked how Bergen made fun of the interlocator. It was like a virtuous duel, where after Bergen's verbal outburst, the opponent could only gasp for air and frantically try to find something to answer. When Stanley grew up, he was sent to DeWitt Clinton High School, located in the Bronx. He also continued to enjoy reading and gradually worked on developing his own writing skills, dreaming of one day writing the great American novel and winning the Pulitzer Prize. At school, he joined the editorial staff of the school literary magazine, but as it turned out, he was most interested in the entire process of publishing, not in writing or editorial work, but in its realization. The very process of selling the publication to readers. He declared himself an advertising director and organized such a stormy activity that no one had any doubt that he had an innate gift for this. Even then, he had a certain craving for charismatic or outrageous actions, but he never did something just like that. Lee always knew what he was doing and why, and his innate talent helped him subtly feel the needs and moods of his audience, suggesting the most winning marketing strategies. For example, his colleagues in the editorial office mentioned that once, when they were doing repairs, he took paint and wrote on the ceiling, Stan Lee is a god. Far from a modest statement, but he certainly attracted attention, forcing everyone to talk about him and his eccentricity. Attention, fame, recognition of Stanley. Stan Lee, he already planned that he must get all this from his life. But he was still far from the peak of glory, and in order to help his family and somehow earn his own pocket money, the smart and clever boy tried many different occupations. He wrote obituaries for the news service and press releases for the National Tuberculosis Center, delivered sandwiches, was a ticket taker in a Broadway theater, sold subscriptions to the New York Herald Tribune newspaper. He wanted so many things, saw himself in so many different roles in life, and only one of these roles was the role of a writer. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a writer. I mean, I wanted to be so many things, and a writer was one of them. I wanted to be an advertising man. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a writer. I, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I never could go to law school. So. Lee got his first serious job in 1939 when one of his relatives hired the young man as an assistant at Timely Comics, a division of the Martin Goodman Publishing House, which was engaged in the comics issue. And although this work was related to the world of comics, he had nothing to do with the creative process at the beginning. And I was hired to fill the ink wells. They used ink in those days. And to run down and get him a sandwich and to do proofreading. Was it Marvel Comics then? No, no, it was, I think, Timely Comics. 
and I was the best proofreader you ever saw, because I enjoyed those stories. I couldn't wait to read them. And then they let me do some writing, because there was nobody else around. And for some reason that I never knew why, they got fired after a while. And I was the only guy left in the, in the department. So the publisher said to me, hey, can you run things until I hire an adult? I was only about 18. <laughs> I said, you know, when you're 18, what do you know? I said, sure, I can do it. He started as an errand boy, and at that moment, he was completely satisfied with it. Because he was never particularly interested in comics, he had no idea how and what works in this business, and therefore, to begin with, it was firstly a job for which he was paid, and secondly, he had plenty of time between assignments to take a closer look and understand what exactly he would be able to do in Timely. Assigned to the duo Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, where Simon wrote the texts and Kirby drew, the young man immediately immersed himself in the atmosphere of creating the first issues of Captain America. Of course, he was interested, but before that, he had never even thought about creating comics and saw this work as temporary. I had never thought of writing comics. And in those days, nobody thought of writing comics. Nobody had any respect for comics, really. People thought they were either written for semi-literate adults or very young children. And um, so I figured, I'll keep the job for a while. I need some money, but at some point I'll go out and get a real job. Since Stanley had been restless and thirsty for action since childhood, he was not very inspired to endlessly run for sandwiches or pour ink into squid. Very soon he was so fired up that he wanted to try himself in action, namely in writing texts, because he really liked it and he was always surprisingly good at it. And soon when Kirby and Simon were convinced that the young man was not only a clever messenger, but also quite clever and sharp with a word. With the blessings of his boss Goodman, the young man was assigned to add the text filler to the comic about Captain America. It was not exactly a contribution to the plot of the drawn comic, but it was already his first printed word in a timely comics issue. It was then that he first signed his work under the pseudonym Stan Lee, which he easily invented even earlier in school. This is how the young author-writer Stan Lee was officially born, and the boy Stan Lee faded into memory. In fact, there are different versions of why Stanley started using the pseudonym. Either he wanted to forever put an end to the story of his poor childhood during the Great Depression and enter a new, more prosperous life with a new name. Perhaps he was ashamed to sign such a frivolous and unprestigious literary work as writing comics with his real name, because since childhood he dreamed of writing a highly artistic novel. In this third issue of Captain America, Stan got a chance to prove himself and show the publisher his vision of what stories should be. At that time, it happened in this industry that the main readers of comics were children, and for them, the volume of characters or well-written, meaningful dialogues were not very important. But for the young author, such an approach was not at all interesting. Therefore, Lee wrote his story in a way that he would be interested in reading. From a flat character with short, unambiguous phrases, Captain America turned into a personality, because the young man brought the captain's alter ego, an ordinary person, Steve Rogers, out of the shadows, adding this volume to the entire character. It was a very modern approach. Furthermore, Stan paid more attention to the dialogues and departed from the standard scheme according to which all publishers, not only Marvel, created their superhero stories. Of course, after that, Goodman decided to take a closer look at Stan and later, already in the fifth issue, assigned him to act as the author of the comic text himself, which Lee already wrote under his other pseudonym, Real Nats. Following this, the young man was involved in the joint creation of a hero named Destroyer, and immediately after that, the publisher entrusted him to create his own new character from scratch, and it was the Iceman, Jack Frost. The far north, challenging, mysterious, foreboding, the land that no man really knows, and this great frozen waste surrounded by an eternal, deathly quiet, lives a person we have all heard of, but few men have seen. The King of the Cold, Jack Frost. In Lee's interpretation, Jack Frost was a half-man, half-icicle who lived on the eternal ice edge, the North Pole, and already in his very first story, Lee showed his vision of what a comic book should be. In addition to Lee's bright and recognizable writing style, the meaningful load that he later invested in all his creations was also evident there. What did the ambitious Stan Lee want to add and put into his comics that they didn't have before? Dramaturgy. In Lee's vision, even a superhero was interesting only when he constantly oscillated between two conflicting ideals, and the force that drove the story should be the moral conflict, not the external plot. It is not for nothing that Stan Lee had read so much as a child and as a teenager, not skipping either the Bible or the classics such as Shakespeare. 
And although he did not manage to create a great American novel during his lifetime, he brought a literary approach to places where such a thing had not even been thought of before him. He never calculated for whom exactly he was writing his stories. In his opinion, comics should be such that everyone would be interested in reading them, both adults and children. I've tried to write stories that anybody and everybody would enjoy. <clears throat> I've tried to make them understandable enough and exciting or suspenseful or interesting enough for youngsters to hold their interest. And I've tried to make them hopefully intelligent enough for older people. Um, it, it seems to me all of the things that I loved to read when I was a kid, I think they would have been good for any people of any age. Over the years, Stan developed this concept more and more, which eventually led him to create one of the most striking superheroes, a character that was truly unlike any that had ever been created before him. And not only with his unique superpowers and appearance, but also with his human component, his personality. Spider-Man. But about him a little later. Meanwhile, with the appearance of Jack Frost, Stan started to see the world of comics differently. He could create. Yes, this wasn't the writing of a real novel, but it was already creativity, inventing, fantasizing, exactly what he always loved the most and in which he constantly practiced since childhood. It might go on like this for a while, but fate gave Lee another chance for change and self-realization. Whether it happened with his help or not, none of the parties have any evidence. Kirby and Simon blamed Lee for it, but Stan in all interviews just shrugged his shoulders and answered that he had no idea how it happened. But what was it all about? Kirby and Simon, believing that they were not getting enough for their work at Timely Comics, agreed to work at the same time for their competitors, DC Comics. When Martin Goodman found out about it, he got angry and kicked them both out. However, this happened just after the duo of comic artists had initiated Lee into their secret affairs. Nevertheless, by firing Kirby and Simon, Goodman cut off both of his legs because he was left not only without an author and an artist, but also without the editor-in-chief, whose position was held by Simon. And that's when his attention focused on Stan Lee. In fact, at that moment, Goodman had no one to choose from, and Stan had already proven himself as a bright and productive author, and the publisher also had time to appreciate the young man's business acumen and considerable organizational dexterity. And Stan Lee, 18 years old, became the sole editor-in-chief of Timely Comics and its main author. And I was the only guy left in the, in the department, so the publisher said to me, hey, can you run things until I hire an adult? I was only about 18. <laughs> I said, you know, when you're 18, what do you know? I said, sure, I can do it. And I think he forgot about the adult, and I stayed there ever since. How many young men at that age could cope with such a load? And it is not only about the purely physical burden of a crazy working day. Young Stan had to dive headfirst, not only into the process of creating characters and writing texts, but also to take on all the organizational responsibilities of controlling the work of the entire editorial office. Of course, it was difficult for him, but also interesting. It was another challenge. Movement, conquering a new height, and Lee's active nature never shied away from this. Let's not forget prestige. Although it was not the most prestigious area, just some comics, but at his age, he was already the chief editor and art director and also the main author. Of course, this greatly pleased the young man. But he also had to fight for these titles a lot. In order to somehow separate these three hypostases in the life of the editorial office, he even used various fictitious names, among which were Stan Lee, Stan Martin, and others. He hired a lot of freelancers and tried to somehow cope with all this work while not forgetting to be his true self, a young man full of energy who did not shy away from jokes and fooling around. The adult part of the editorial office was often shocked by Stan's nature. He played the ocarina, filling the office space with melodies. Sometimes he came into work in some strange hat. Sometimes he invented something else. But what was most impressive was his manner of conveying his creative ideas to others. He literally turned into a one-man show. In one person, he played all the characters of the story he invented, desperately gesticulating, imitating sounds, sometimes using the desktop as a stage or pretending that he was conducting an orchestra. He was hired just to fill in and they never let him go after that. He just took over. He used to stand on a um, box and he was tall and thin and he would do this. He loved, he always wanted to be a, have a baton, so he would move the baton and talk to them. 
Martin Goodman was impressed by the virtuous ease with which Lee juggled his responsibilities and gave the young man more and more freedom. Who knows in which direction Timely would continue to develop, but Pearl Harbor in 1941 changed everything. Almost everyone from Lee's entourage went to serve, and he also joined the ranks of the U.S. Army in 1942, temporarily inviting Vince Fago to take his place. World War II broke out, and I, I, like an idiot, I volunteered. I wanted to be a hero, but I never got overseas. I, I enlisted, and they put me in the Signal Corps, and I trained to be one of these fellows that goes ahead of the troops and fixes the wires for communication. I, I trained, to, I learned how to climb telegraph poles and string wires and put them ahead so they had radio communicate. whatever. I don't even remember what it was, but I was real good at climbing telegraph poles. From the very beginning, Lee was assigned to the Signal Corps, but this is probably where Stan's self-promotion intervened and worked. In the stories about his civilian life, he colorfully painted his identity as a comic book editor in his own artistic talents. The command, decided that such a talent had another, more appropriate application and sent him to the training film division where visual training materials were created for various troops' units. There, Stan managed to apply his talents precisely as a comic artist, for example, in creating a visual illustrated guide for the payroll department or in his more famous work which was probably familiar to everyone in the U.S. Army at that time, an agitator poster in favor of protected sex. Working in the newsroom, Lee had become accustomed to a very busy schedule, and so, seeing that he still had plenty of free time after completing official assignments, he arranged with Fago to mail him weekly assignments, and Stan would send back finished works in a couple of days. At that time, the young man was only a little over 20. He did not study in college, he worked all the time, he dreamed of a fun, riotous student life which he did not succeed in. And on the background of these emotions, with the money earned both in Timely and in the Army, Stan bought his first car, a Buick. That's when a young man could finally start dating girls and involve himself into more romances. But this did not mean at all that he forgot about work. He managed everything, and when, after the end of the war in 1945, he returned to his place as an editor in Timely, full of fresh ideas and stormy plans, it turned out that all this enthusiasm was wasted. After the end of the war, after everything that society had to go through, fictional superheroes no longer seemed as attractive and interesting to readers as before, and no matter how Lee tried to revive the publishing house's products, no matter what marketing tricks he came up with, no matter how mind-blowing the plots he invented were, sales continued to decline. Even the beloved Captain America ceased to interest the reader and stopped existing in 1949. After analyzing what was happening, Lee and Goodman concluded that the unceasing development of television was to blame for it. So they decided to make the main characters of their comics those characters who were the most popular on TV. They began to release stories about cowboys, detectives, and other favorites of the TV audience. Things seemed to have settled down. Stan was making good money, he could afford what he had only dreamed of as a child, and as far as professional activity was concerned, Lee's wild imagination and active nature were frankly bored. It was just a good, post-war job that provided some sort of stability. In 1947, when he married the love of his life, the beautiful British model Joan Clayton Bucock, he was especially eager to seek change. Just at that time, he began to think about the possibilities of his career outside the world of comics, and from these thoughts he made a new project, the magazine Secrets Behind the Comics. It was a 100-page pamphlet that was actually self-published by Stan and contained a variety of interesting insights into the world of comics, a kind of invitation to the kitchen through the service door. With Goodman's permission, the book featured all of Timely's famous characters, and Lee brought in several artists from the publishing house with whom he usually collaborated. Stan's brochure was inspired by the publication of his article entitled There's Money in Comics in the Writer's Digest magazine, popular among the writing community, which, moreover, published a portrait of the handsome 25-year-old Lee with a pipe in his teeth on the cover of the issue. It was already a kind of popularity among the wider masses than comic book readers. In the article, he precisely described his point of view on the comic's creation, which distinguished the very style that Lee started. This is of prime importance. The era of Captain America hitting Red Skull and shouting, So you wanna play, eh? is over. Today, with the comic magazine business being one of the most highly competitive fields, each editor tries to get the best and snappiest dialogue possible for his characters. In writing a comic strip, have your characters speak like real people, not the inhabitants of a strange and baffling new world. But did he get such desired fame from this long dreamed of publicity? Unfortunately, not yet. 
Goodman only asked to write articles for the popular men's magazine, which at that time was the main income of the publishing house. Life went on. He and Joan had a daughter, Joan Celia, in 1950, and a few years later, in 1953, a second daughter, Jan Lee, who died a few days after birth. Furthermore, after the death of his mother, Stan and Joan took in Stan's orphaned younger brother Larry Lieber, who was only 15 at the time. Later, Larry also joined the Marvel family for a time as a writer and artist. Home and family demanded attention, and as for work, Lee later referred to the 50s in his career as his limbo years. I still felt I was going nowhere. How could I keep getting older and older and still be writing comic books? Where and when would it stop? Ever since his marriage, Lee paid more and more attention to his family because the comic routine dragged on and he was increasingly annoyed by the trends that were becoming more and more apparent in the industry. Everything was aimed only at making money, at any cost. They did not shy away from promoting violence, sex, and more and more filth poured onto the pages of comics. In the late 1940s, it got to the point where being a comic artist became a shame because it frankly smelled bad. And when Stan and I would go to a party and they would say, um, what does your husband do? And I'd say, he's a writer. What does he write? He writes, um, he writes, um, he writes comic books. And they'd go, oh, and move <laughs> quietly away. Or they'd say, oh, we don't let our children read comic books. You know, it was that. And so, against the background of this decline in society, a crusade against comics, led by psychiatrist Frederick Wortham, gradually began to brew. His book, Seduction of the Innocent, published in 1954, reinforced his claim that reading comic books turned teenagers into juvenile delinquents. It got to the point that an investigation into the harmful effects of comics was initiated by a U.S. Senate committee. In turn, the publishers, trying to act in advance in such a devastating situation for themselves, created the American Association of Comic Publishers and approved the Comics Code Authority, which was supposed to control and censor the products of the comic industry. In the wake of all this, Goodman also lost financially and instructed Lee to fire most of the staff, so in fact, only Lee and a minimal team of freelancers remained in the publishing house. This lasted until the end of the 50s, when Stan Lee invited the same, Jack Kirby, to cooperate and together, they began to develop a new, completely innovative idea. Those who knew this creative couple and saw them at work often compared them with another famous creative duo at that time, Lennon McCartney. And there's probably something in this, because like the Beatles in the world of music, the Kirby-Lee duo created a real phenomenon in the world of comics. Rumor has it that when Kirby and Lee worked on the idea, it was like a juggling act. When they picked up and complimented each other, and from their completely different visions, a web of incredible stories was woven in a strange way, which they later embodied in the pages of their comics. But there are other testimonies, including Jack Kirby's interview in which he spoke about the fact that Lee, loaded with the organization of the editorial work, often had nothing to do with the creative process. I could never see Stan Lee as being creative. I think Stan has a god complex. Right now, he's the father of the Marvel Universe. Which one of them to believe? Perhaps here, as in the story with Steve Ditko, the truth is somewhere in the middle. As we have said before, in the case of Stan Lee, the search for the truth about him should be sought somewhere between his own numerous interviews, autobiographical books, and the statements of his Marvel colleagues. Did he directly immerse himself in the entire process of working on the comic, from start to finish, down to the smallest details? Many say no. Were the very first moving ideas about the characters, plot twists, conflict of the future story exactly his ideas? Most likely, yes. And we will accept this as a fact. Nevertheless, the new idea to which Stan then connected Jack Kirby would not be the final big break, but it was already the beginning. Before this, it would be necessary to go through a difficult path of several years, during which Lee desperately tried to find his vision of what a comic book should be, because in this regard, his original creative vision did not coincide with the vision of his boss, Martin Goodman. If, for Goodman, a comic book was just a mediocre, colorful pamphlet that was created purely to make money, Lee saw it somewhat differently. While I was working for Marvel, the first 20 years or so, I was just doing regular comics. Then, after a while, I really wanted to quit because I felt, while Martin Goodman was a great guy and a good publisher, I didn't like really what he wanted me to do. He kept, he, he felt comics were just for young kids or stupid adults. And he used to say to me, remember Stan, 
Don't use words of more than two syllables. Don't have too much dialogue. Get a lot of action. Don't worry about characterization. And that was fine. I was doing it, and the books were doing well, and I had a steady job, but it wasn't satisfying. For Stan, doing something just to earn money while remaining behind the scenes did not correspond to his character and personality type at all. He had to create something unique, different from what others were doing, so that it would definitely be talked about and at the same time so that everyone would know the author. If not in person, then by name for sure. Lee was always ambitious. And why not if you really deserve it? And he really deserved it. A lot of controversial things can be said about Lee, but the fact remains. Thanks to his work, comics have qualitatively evolved, rising to a much higher level than they were before and entering a new era that continues to this day. Not without Stan, but without him, it would most likely not exist. Because I really think of myself as a reasonably good writer. I, I like to write. So I really wanted to quit and try something else. And I remember Joan said to me, you know, Stan, if you want to quit, before you do, why don't you do one book the way you would like to do it? The worst that happens is Martin will fire you, and so what? You want to quit anyway. So what did Lee come up with in order to bring the publishing house out of decline and open new perspectives for himself and his desire for well-deserved fame? During his entire creative life, Stan, independently or in collaboration, created more than 300 characters. Some of them are not very well known and appeared in only a few issues, while others, on the contrary, after hundreds of printed issues on paper, got a new life on the cinema screen. But there are also those that are of special importance because they were the first, the ones that changed everything forever. It so happened that just on the verge of breaking, when Lee was about to leave again, fate once again gave Lucky Stan another opportunity. Martin Goodman came to him with an offer. Just this time, their main competitor, DC Comics, released a new comic, the idea of which was somewhat different from what was created before. DC came up with a story not about one character, but about a whole group of superheroes, and called them the Justice League of America. And these comics began to sell very well. Of course, Goodman immediately wanted to copy such success and ran to Stan Lee with an order to create a similar comic. It was a chance, but Stan wouldn't be Stan Lee if he didn't do it his way. So I figured this is my chance to do it my way. So I came up with something I called the Fantastic Four, about four superheroes. But instead of making them heroes who wore costumes, I figured I'm not going to give them costumes. Because I always felt if I had a superpower, why would I want to put on a costume? First of all, I'm too much of a show-off. I'd want everybody to know it's me. I would never wear a mask. And why would I need a costume if I could jump over a building? His four characters, which he called the Fantastic Four from the very beginning of the story, are shown to the reader as ordinary people in their ordinary life circumstances. Yes, they are unusual. Yes, they have superpowers, but they also have ordinary lives, everyday problems, everyday choices. No one had done this before. And this new Lee's creation hooked the reader from the very first pages. Moreover, each of the four had a bright individual character and confidently deferred from the superhero templates accepted at that time. As Stan Lee's biographer, Abraham Reisman, wrote, Superhero stories were supposed to be about genial people who happily stumble upon superhuman abilities, then go on their merry way toward justice. That mold was forever broken with the Fantastic Four, who are depicted as having their powers forced upon them quite painfully. Mr. Fantastic, Reed Richards, the scientific genius and group leader, was a character partially copied from Lee himself. He liked long monologues, showed off his erudition, and was somewhat boring. The youngest in the group, Human Torch Johnny Storm, was not just a classic comic book teenager who caught every word of the main character and drooled over the possession of superhero powers. The Johnny created by Lee didn't want to have these powers. He'd rather be a regular guy if he had the choice. The only woman in the group, Invisible Woman, Sue Storm, instead of being a classic damsel in distress, is also possessed by superpowers and was an equal team member. The fourth character, the monster, Thing, Ben Grimm, was the most loved by readers because Lee gave him the brightest and most controversial character. Those who personally knew the creators of the four said that his grumpy character was written off of Jack Kirby. And the fourth guy was a monster. They 
something had happened to him and he became very ugly and incredibly strong. And I used him for both pathos and humor because he was always fighting with the others and not physically, but verbally always insulting them and yelling at them. And he was hot tempered and he was always picking on the human torch. That was the teenager who was always picking on him. And I got a lot of comedy out of them. I called him the thing and he became by far and away the most popular member of the group. The Fantastic Four were like a very strange and crazy family where everyone fought with everyone, but at the same time loved and always supported each other. It was something new, fresh, at the same time superheroic and as closely to reality as possible. Because even instead of traditionally settling the heroes in some invented place such as Metropolis or Gotham City, Lee settled his four in the ordinary world of New York, forcing them to travel on transport familiar to everyone visit the same institutions as ordinary, real people. Moreover, the new comic also differed from its predecessors in its visual presentation. In the four, Kirby gave free reign to his artistic genius and greatly increased the level of skill in drawing plots. He also resorted to such a technique as increasing the number of close-ups on the characters' faces so that their emotions were clearly visible. These innovative ideas hit the nail on the head. The Fantastic Four, which was first presented to readers in 1961, was a wild success. The editorial office was flooded with letters, which, according to Stan, had never happened before. That ice broke, and the public was clearly ready to accept something new. The Fantastic Four was the beginning of change, and for a while distracted Stan Lee from wanting to tie himself with comics forever. But did the new trend he started easily catch on? Although Goodman, who by that time had already managed to rename the publishing house from Timely to Atlas, and from Atlas to Marvel, in the wake of the obvious financial success of the four, demanded from Stan the creation of new superhero groups. Lee, as always, already had his own plan. Inspired by the success of the four, he immediately set about creating a new original character, the idea of which had been in his head for a long time, and which again should become something completely innovative and unusual. Lee's restless nature pushed him not to stop at what he had achieved, and in 1962, the first issue with a new hero was already released. When talking about the origin of the idea, he always mentioned his admiration for the 1931 film Frankenstein, where the role of the monster was played by Boris Karloff. A gloomy black and white graphic film in which the figure of the monster evoked sympathy rather than fear or condemnation. In the Frankenstein movie, I always felt the monster is really the good guy. He didn't want to hurt anybody. All those idiots with torches were always chasing him up and down the hills. I thought it would be fun to get a monster who was really a good guy, but nobody knew that. And then he immediately remembered another well-known dark story, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So, Stan, to some extent, combined these two lead motifs when he came up with his Hulk, in which both the angry green monster Hulk and the gloomy scientist Bruce Banner, the victim of a scientific experiment and his own arrogant negligence, got along at the same time. According to Lee's favorite scheme for creating a bright character, here there was an acute internal conflict, which in case of the Hulk was also supplemented by the conflict of the physical separation of the character into two personalities. Not just some torment of choice or conscience, but a classic dissociative identity disorder with which the hero somehow had to exist and adapt his whole life to it. Banner didn't just have superpowers and was somehow externally transformed. Stanley's Hulk was created as a multiple personality, each of which individually had its own patterns of perception and interaction with the surrounding world. And he became so, not out of his own will, but saving the life of another person, teenager Rick Jones, who later became his devoted assistant. Defiantly twisted? You bet. But did the new character have the success that his creator expected from him? Did he get the recognition he deserved? Did it become clear to the reader? Mm, yes and no. Hulk turned out to be just the case when the initial success among the general readership was quite moderate, and Goodman playing it safe stopped printing already at the sixth issue, because sales data had not yet arrived, but the publisher had more than enough doubts about the appropriateness of such a hero. Eventually, however, it turned out that in a certain niche of readers, the Green Monster broke records. Hulk became a real hit among student fans, young intellectuals who in some way associated themselves with the scientist Dr. Banner, led existential arguments about the specifics of his personality, appreciated the multi-layeredness and non-triviality of this gloomy character, constantly immersed in his own thoughts. 
1965, the Hulk entered the ranking of the 28 most respected figures among American students in a survey conducted by Esquire magazine where alongside the name of the Hulk were such names as John Kennedy and Bob Dylan. Another Stanley's superhero son who was created after the Hulk in 1962 got into the same rating, the one with the appearance of which a new golden era of comics officially began. In 1962, on the wave of the revival of the comic's popularity, after the wild success of the new characters of the Fantastic Four and the unexpected success of the Hulk, Stanley received from his boss the task of creating another superhero. To come up with something new, fresh, that will also be successful, Stan had another idea. Instead of another adult superhero endowed with some extraordinary powers, he decided to make his new hero an ordinary teenager. At the same time, not a cool guy, popular, sporty, dating the most beautiful girl at school, but someone completely opposite. He was supposed to be the most ordinary guy. Nothing special. I was lucky with Peter Parker when I came up with that character because he seems to have struck a chord with, with so many readers. And I think it's because he's probably more like a regular person, a normal person than any other character. And I try to make him that way because I guess until Peter Parker, no superhero or no superhero's alter ego had ever had to worry about making a living, um, getting along well with girls, being popular. In all comics created before this, teenage heroes were always only in secondary roles. They could be nothing more than a superhero sidekick. There was also a certain ideological component in this. The superhero mentor usually taught his protege from the height of his age and life experience. He told what was good and what was bad. In this way, the main reader, a teenager who associated himself with such a young character, had to unobtrusively receive instructions about life. But Lee's invented teenager, Peter Parker, was completely different. And again, I tried to keep it realistic. In order not to make him a typical hero, I made him an average guy who was kind of unpopular. He was sort of a nerd. Uh, the kids didn't like him. They thought he was a bookworm. He didn't have enough money. He had to support his old aunt. Um, he was an orphan. Uh, he was shy and so forth. And it turned out he was somebody that the readers could relate to. Stan decided that if a teenager who can't deal with his ordinary life because of transitionary age, growing up, changes, suddenly, besides all of it, would receive some superpower with which he would also have to cope. This would bring the story a powerful double conflict. Lee literally enjoyed creating such situations. He was finally making a comic the way he was interested in making it. I always enjoyed doing things where Peter Parker had to become Spider-Man and go over there in order to save the world or the city or Mary Jane or somebody. But at the same time, Aunt May needed her medicine <laughs> or she might die. <laughs> and the only place to get the medicine was in the drugstore over there. But Peter had to do either one of those in the next five minutes. <laughs> and there wasn't time to do them both. And what would he do? And I tried to come up with as many situations of that type as possible. Each hero should have some unique superpower, something that will set them apart from everyone else. As a superpower for this guy, Lee chose the power of a spider and came up with a name for him, Spider-Man. Why a spider? As Stan later recalled in his interview with Larry King, I saw a fly crawling on the wall and I said, wow, suppose a person has the power to stick to a wall like an insect. So I was off and running and I thought, what do I call him? I tried Mosquito Man, but that didn't have any glamour. Insect Man. That was even worse. I went down the line and I got to Spider-Man. It sounded mysterious and dramatic. But this idea did not inspire Goodman at all. A teenage hero? A normal teenager with his problems with relationships with his peers? His first love? He told Stan that he was out of his mind and it wouldn't sell. He gave me 1,000 reasons why Spider-Man would never work. Nobody likes spiders. It sounds too much like Superman. And how could a teenager be a superhero? Here, in fact, came the moment when Stan Lee almost tied the knot with comics for good. He was really tired of fighting with Goodman every time to implement his ideas and trying to take comics to a level that he would not be ashamed of. It was when he was one step away from making this decision that Joan intervened. 
but more about that later. It turned out that in August 1962, Lee had a chance to bring out to the people his new character, betting his future in the world of comics on him. Stan offered his boss to print a trial issue of Amazing Adult Fantasy, a comic book series that was about to be shut down due to low sales. He changed the hero's name to Spider-Man to sound less like Superman and put him on the cover of the issue. So, the company took no chances by releasing such an ambiguous superhero in an issue that no one would read anyway. But unexpectedly for the publisher, the opposite happened. A month later, all the sales figures came in. My publisher came racing into my office. Stan, Stan, you remember that character we both love so much, Spider-Man? Let's do him as a series. It was a success. A breakthrough. An explosion. After which Lee had a chance to finally realize his vision and develop his ideas. It is the appearance of Spider-Man that most researchers and loyal fans of the Marvel Universe call the beginning of a revolution in the world of comics. But was Stan Lee the only one who made Spider-Man what he eventually became? Yes, an interesting idea has a huge success rate, but this idea of Stan's still had to be drawn and embodied on paper. So when Lee had this idea, he immediately turned to a comics artist with whom he had already collaborated on several projects, Jack Kirby. He quickly sketched the first few pages of the story and they met to discuss what came out and exchange ideas. Stan was very unhappy with Kirby's suggested version, not because he didn't like how he did it. Kirby, as always, was on top, but his version of Spider-Man, in Lee's opinion, was too adult. In general, he somewhat resembled Captain America in terms of his physique and suit scheme, and Lee wanted something completely different. And then Steve Ditko, another artist of the publishing house, intervened in the conversation, offering to draw his version because he had an idea. Ditko felt exactly what Lee wanted and enthusiastically took up the visual embodiment of the new superhero. One of the first things I did was to work up a costume, a vital, visual part of the character. I had to know how he looked. For example, a clinging power so he wouldn't have hard shoes or boots, a hidden wrist shooter versus a web gun and holster, etc. I wasn't sure Stan would like the idea of covering the character's face, but I did it because it hid an obviously boyish face. It would also add mystery to the character. This is how the image of Spider-Man, which we are all used to, was born. Stan was delighted. However, he rejected the cover of the very first issue drawn by Ditko and instead instructed Kirby to draw the same plot, slightly changing it. But in general, he and Ditko cooperated quite well and fruitfully for quite a long time creating more and more news stories about a teenager with spider superpowers, Peter Parker. Stan came up with a story, briefly telling it to Ditko, and Ditko drew the entire action. Then on those drawings, Stan wrote dialogues, phrases, and sounds. So, can we consider Stan Lee the only creator of Spider-Man because he came up with the character and the comic idea, or Steve Ditko because he came up with his appearance and how these stories should be visually embodied? Both had their own opinions on this. But the fact that Ditko left Marvel was not connected with the Spider-Man authorship from the beginning. The conflict was brewing gradually and imperceptibly. Ditko had strongly expressed political views, which he increasingly tried to extend to the pages of comics. Over time, he and Lee increasingly diverged in their vision of how the plot should unfold. Disagreement there, misunderstanding here. And Steve Ditko left Marvel in 1966. The question of Spider-Man's authorship surfaced publicly many years after Comic Book Marketplace magazine published an article about Lee in the 90s, and later Time magazine wrote about him as the sole creator of Spider-Man. That's when Steve Ditko voiced his claim, which apparently has been a sensitive topic for him for years. He contacted Stan, 30 years after the two had last spoken at all, and expressed his displeasure with the fact that all these years, all the laurels for the creation of this character, undoubtedly historic to the world of comics, belongs solely to Stan Lee. What could Stan say? After so many years, it probably shouldn't be so important to him. Who knows? He agreed to confirm Ditko's co-authorship because there was little verbal confirmation of that, but the phraseological turns with which he confirmed it also caused some doubt because they could be interpreted ambiguously. According to Stan, Ditko was not very satisfied with this, so Stan wrote a letter that read something like, To whom it may concern, this is to state that I consider Steve Ditko to be the co-creator of Spider-Man along with me. Stan sent this letter, adding, You can show this to anyone you want to. But Steve still wasn't completely satisfied. Since that time, they did not communicate anymore, and only in the last year of his life, in 2018 after Steve Ditko's death, on his Twitter page, Stan Lee published a video in which he publicly paid tribute to Ditko's unique talent. 
Steve was certainly one of the most important creators in the comic book business. His talent was indescribable. I worked with him for many years and was always impressed with how he saw everything in terms of photos and pictures and movements and scenes. He told a story like a fine movie director would. You made a real impression here in the world. Excelsior! The Spider-Man creation marked the beginning of a whole galaxy of bright and original fantastic superheroes, which were constantly invented by Stanley's vivid imagination. Interesting contradictory characters, extraordinary life circumstances, non-trivial conditions for the heroes to obtain superpowers. All this invariably distinguished Stanley's children from all others. Perhaps the secret recipe of his characters is that Lee incredibly successfully combined two sources in their creation real life, with all its complications and drama and all that he had read during his life from classic literature to fairy tales. He approached the creation of his comics as inventing fairy tales which always inspired him. Just remember stories of giants and witches and wizards and monsters, but then you get a little older and you're too old to read fairy tales, but you never outgrow your love of that type of story. And if you think about it, Superheroes stories today are really like fairy tales for grown-ups. The characters are bigger than life, just like in fairy tales. They have the same type of superpowers. Some can fly, some are extra strong, some can be invisible. Over time, other comic book publishers, seeing the success of Stan's trend, began to try to do something similar for themselves. A lot of that was also very successful, but it wasn't part of the Marvel Universe. And the Marvel Universe was gradually filled with new characters created by Stan Lee in his characteristic style. In 1962, Lee, together with Jack Kirby, decided to transfer the Scandinavian thunder god Thor to the comic book pages. Having thrown the main idea into work, Stan entrusted the writing of the full version of the script to his younger brother Larry because he was preoccupied with other publishing matters. How do you make someone stronger than the strongest person? It finally came to me. Don't make him human, make him a god. I decided readers were already pretty familiar with the Greek and Roman gods. It might be fun to delve into the old Norse legends. Besides, I pictured Norse gods looking like Vikings of old with the flowing beards, horned helmets, and battle clubs. After the success of the Fantastic Four and subsequent superheroes, Lee was not going to stop, so he was constantly thinking about what could be done differently in the following stories. We had a character with the powers of a spider, he thought. We had a hulking monster. We had a god. We had all those things. Then Lee thought, how about taking a big guy and a very small one and combine them in one character? So in the same fruitful 1962, the trio created another interesting character, Ant-Man. Under this pseudonym was the scientist Hank Pym, whom, thanks to the superhero costume, was able to change his size and communicate with insects. He wasn't as popular as Spider-Man or Thor, but that didn't stop the publisher from creating new characters. And in 1963, the one who would found the Marvel Cinematic Universe many years later appeared, the one and only Iron Man. I, I made up a guy named um, Iron Man who was sort of like Howard Hughes. He was an inventor, an industrialist. He made munitions, all the things the kids hate. But I said, I'm going to make the kids like him. And apparently they did. Iron Man was a very successful strip, and it's still, they're making a movie of him now. I thought it would be fun to take the kind of character that nobody would like, none of the readers would like, and shove him down their throats and make them like him, Lee recalled. And for this, it was necessary to invent such a plot twist which would change the hero's views on life and force him to start fighting evil. Also, Stark was captured during a trip to a war zone and returned from there as a different person. Under Lee's leadership, this hero went through his difficult path of personal growth and at the same time illustrated the ambiguous attitude of Americans to the war in Vietnam. 1963 gave us another interesting character. Doctor Strange is a brilliant but very arrogant neurosurgeon. Dr. Stephen Strange loses the most valuable thing he had in his life in a car accident, his surgeon's hands. But in search of alternative healing methods, he not only transforms as a person, but also gets superpowers. The character's idea and the first sketches belonged to Steve Ditko, which was officially recognized by Lee, but they were later worked out by Ditko and Lee together, and Stan enriched the character with his ideas. Speaking of that, I had a character called Dr. Strange who was a magician, master of the mystic arts. He was another one who was popular. And um, when he would do his magical thing, 
I couldn't just have him say abracadabra or something. So I made up incantations for him. Like he would say, if he wanted to throw a bolt of lightning at a villain, he'd say, by the hoary hosts of Hoggoth, so let it be, or things like that. <laughs> by the shades of the shadowy seraphim. In 1963, Professor X and X-Men appeared. The idea to make a comic book about mutant heroes was born when Lee decided to create another team of superheroes, but did not want to explain where they got their superpowers from. I couldn't have everybody bitten by a radioactive spider or exposed to a gamma ray explosion, and I took the cowardly way out. I said to myself, why don't I just say they're mutants? They are born that way. The further, the more. 1964. Daredevil. Lawyer Matt Murdock, who lost his sight as a child, but this injury greatly sharpened all his other senses. Working as a lawyer by day, he turns into a ruthless avenger at night, whose only goal is to ensure that justice is not blind. The next one I made blind. I thought it'd be fun to have a blind superhero because I had read somewhere when you lose your sight, all your other senses become magnified. Mm. So I thought it would be great if we have a guy, even though we can't see, he can do anything better than anyone else. Mm. He'd have a radar sense, a sonar sense. He could tell if you're lying because he could hear your, your heartbeat change the rhythm. He could read by running his finger over a newspaper because his fingers are so sensitive. Like with Braille, he could actually feel the newsprint on the paper. And um, he'd be the world's greatest gymnast because you get your balance from your ear. So I love Daredevil. He became very popular. 1966, Black Panther. T'Challa is the king of the fictional African tribe of Wakanda, endowed with extraordinary abilities which he received thanks to the passage of an ancient tribe ritual. Black Panther was the first black superhero created by Marvel. I wasn't thinking of civil rights. I had a lot of friends who were black and we had artists who were black. So it occurred to me, why aren't there any black heroes? Lee and Kirby could not share the authorship of this character for a long time. Lee claimed that the idea was his, and Kirby said he came up with it. I came up with the Black Panther because I realized I had no blacks in my strip. Kirby recalled, I'd never drawn a black. I needed a black. I suddenly discovered that I had a lot of black readers. My first friend was black, and here I was ignoring them because I was associating with everybody else. In the end, they agreed on co-authorship. And there were other characters who also appeared in the 60s. At first, they were extras in the lines of other heroes. Some of them later got their own comics. Among them, Nick Fury, Hawkeye, Black Widow, Scarlet Witch, The Silver Surfer, Falcon, and many others. All of them both lived their separate lives and united in whole superhero teams, such as the Avengers and X-Men. It was also Stan's original, and as it turned out commercially successful, idea to place his heroes in one universe where they, each having their own separate story and separate life, acted together if necessary. This method of building stories greatly expanded the space for unfolding events and allowed, by involving characters from different separate lines of comics, to raise sales of joint heroic issues. The 1960s were literally explosive years for Marvel because it was at this time that Stan Lee worked most productively in the publishing house as an author and creator. Those were actually his golden years at Marvel. Everyone then worked as a single team. Under the slogans of Marvel in those years, Lee really gathered the best of the best. It was incredible. It was being with people who were absolutely wonderful, joyous people, the artists. Jim Mealy, Ditko, Jack Kirby. Oh God, I'm gonna forget so many. Uh, Jim Mooney was there. So many, and they were all so creative, and there was no jealousy between them. It was a very interesting thing. It really was a bullpen. Marvel was getting stronger and more and more different from its competitors, not only in its products, but also in its working methods. Part of this success was based on a somewhat unconventional scheme of creative cooperation. Usually, as it happened before, and as other publishing houses continued to work, first the writer came up with a plot, wrote a script that briefly contained both dialogue and images, and handed it over to the artist for further refinement. In the method invented by Stan, which was later called the Marvel Method, everything was somewhat different. 
Stan Lee, as we know, was not only a clever inventor of fantastic stories, he was also a talented manager and organizer and did everything to optimize the work process and make it more effective and faster. In those years, Marvel released new comics with lightning speed, and this was possible thanks to the Marvel method, in which both the writer and the artist worked on the comic from the very beginning. Together, they developed the character and plot, then the artist completely drew the entire comic and the writer added the story and dialogues after him. It worked out beautifully because my script did not handicap the artist and he could tell the story any way he wanted. And once the pages would come back, it was so easy for me to add the dialogue and make it exactly fit the expression of the picture. In 1972, Having created the most famous and box office successful Marvel superheroes, at the peak of Marvel's rise, Stan Lee decided to withdraw from the creative process and focus only on the role of publisher and editorial director of the group. All these years, he was torn between a management position, development of marketing strategies, search for new ways of increasing reader involvement in the like of the company and comics creation, and, in fact, characters creation. Stan Lee has always been more than just a comic book writer. He was interested in publicity, searching for new ways of development and increasing financial success. He was an inventor and innovator not only in the field of writing, and at this stage of his life, he decided to concentrate entirely on this. His last issues as a writer of the company's regular comics were The Amazing Spider-Man issue 110 and Fantastic Four issue 125. Besides his managerial activities, Stan, the man, became a key public figure, a kind of ambassador and media face of the company. He enjoyed the finally received publicity, and at the same time as the Marvel brand, he promoted himself as Stan Lee, the creator of the Marvel Universe, and it was his face that became more and more associated with the Marvel name. He gave lectures at colleges, met with the youngest readers, spoke at comic book conventions, participated in various TV shows, gave interviews, on behalf of Marvel. College. I don't know if I mentioned this, but I probably lectured at colleges more than any human being. When I, I became publisher in 1970 or thereabout, from 70 to 80, I don't think a week went by that I wasn't flying to some city in Canada, America, England, somewhere, lecturing about Marvel Comics. As for creative projects, he, of course, did not leave this work completely. In 1977, he launched the Amazing Spider-Man Daily Comic Strip together with illustrator John Romita. In 1978, together with Jack Kirby, they created one of the first of its kind, a real graphic novel, The Silver Surfer, The Ultimate Cosmic Experience. In 1980, together with illustrator John Bushima, they released the first issue of She-Hulk, a female character, Bruce Banner's cousin, who received part of the Hulk's superpowers through a blood transfusion. From time to time, Lee was involved in a number of other projects and collaborations. After moving to California in 1981, Stan Lee worked on the development of Marvel's TV and was in talks with film studios about film projects in which the characters of the Marvel Universe could participate. But at that time, all his efforts in this direction were still in vain, and this idea worked only after several decades. Whatever Lee was doing, it was always related to creativity and entertainment. If you really think about it, <clears throat> the thing that I and people like me do are we try to create things that will entertain the public. And it doesn't matter what form of the media you're working in, you're doing the same thing. You're trying to be entertaining. And you use the same philosophy, the same rules. You try to come up with characters that people will be interested in, and you try to give those characters fascinating things to do. For almost 70 years, which connected Stan with Marvel, he held various management positions. For several years, he was the president of the entire Marvel company with all of its divisions. But in the end, Lee left the position, remaining only as a publisher, wanting to be more involved in the creative process of the company, remaining its chairman emeritus. In addition to his work at Marvel, Stan Lee also had his own projects, such as the internet entertainment company Stan Lee Media. POW Entertainment published several books, the autobiographical Excelsior, The Amazing Life of Stan Lee, and Stan Lee and the Rise and Fall of the American Comic Book, which were published in the early 2000s, as well as a book dedicated to the comics creation, Origins of Marvel Comics, published in 1974. 
He even founded his own comic convention, Kamikaze, and managed to work with Marvel's perennial competitor DC Comics, making a series of comics for them in 2001 called Just Imagine. There was a time about, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago when DC Comics asked me they wanted to do a series of books called What If Stan Lee Had Created the DC Universe or something like that. And they asked me to write Superman, Batman, the Wonder Woman, the Green Lantern, and I don't know, 10 or 12 of their books, as if I had created them. So I changed all of them around. I made Batman a black man. I made the Flash a female. I, I Just for fun, just to make them different. I really enjoyed doing it. When the 2000s began, even those who had never read comics before learned about Stan Lee and his incredible children, because Hollywood blockbusters began to appear on the screens. X-Men, Spider-Man, Daredevil, Fantastic Four, and others, one by one, they began to appear on screens, giving rise to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In 2011, Hollywood paid a lifetime tribute to Stan Lee by giving him a place on the Walk of Fame, where his own star lit up. And this was just one of the many awards that Stan the Man received in recognition of his contribution to modern culture. In 2015, Stan's daughter, J.C. Lee, who by that time had already managed to pave her own creative path as a writer, producer, and actress, released a photo book called Stan Lee's Love Story. It's all about love. In the photo selection of the book, she tried to show what it was like to grow up as the daughter of Stan Lee, to show the relationships that existed in the family. It's really done with just love, and it's really like just sharing something private. My mother said it had passion and certainly filled with love. It's nice to see something a little organic that's done with love and all that good stuff we artists like. But here, as it seems in almost everything related to Stan Lee's life, there are many contradictions. Lee always called J.C. his best creation, and at the same time, in the last years of his life, rivers of dirt poured into the press, as if the relationship between father and daughter was not so cloudless, and about various accusations from both sides, which by no means connected with public manifestations of mutual love. Truth or fiction, Stan tried to keep his face all his life, often even creating his own versions of events or relationships. And in this case, in 2018, in the last year of his life, Stan specially recorded an interview comment about his relationship with his daughter, in which he stated, I want to say as desperately as I can, my relationship with my lovely daughter, JC, is wonderful. When Stan could no longer see or hear well, he still didn't want to stop. According to his daughter, even before his death, he was involved in collaboration on another, his last superhero for Marvel, which was to be called Dirt Man. So then why do you, why do you stay out? Why do you come to work? Why don't you just watch the dancers? Because I want to prove that a guy who can't see well or hear well can <laughs> still be productive. Because I still do all my work. I just, I can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> Until the last years of his life, Stan remained active and full of new ideas. In almost all of his rich creative life, he lived with his Joan, who passed away a year before him. In his comic, Stan Lee necessarily introduced love lines because his heroes were not just machines turned to superheroism. They were all people full of human feelings, including love. Why? Because for Lee, love was really important. Hey, look at that couple. Boy, they sure seem to be in love, huh? You know, what's with that? That's the second time you've commented on couples in love. Well, I, I like that sort of thing. What is 70 years in marriage with the one whom he fell in love with at first sight and proposed in two weeks? It would be worth asking Stan about it because he would definitely have something to say. And he was telling it. He remembered it with warmth, tenderness, and of course, with jokes, which were typical for him. But most importantly, without this love of his life, which Stan Lee was lucky enough to meet, maybe there would be no whole incredible Marvel Universe. Why so? That's exactly what could have happened if at the critical moment of making an important decision, Joan would not be next to Stan and there would not be those fateful words that she said then. It was the late 50s and Stan was literally exhausted from what he was doing at the time because the level of creative output he had to produce under the pressure of publisher Martin Goodman was killing him of any desire to continue making comics. He was ready to leave and here Joan played her part giving him advice without which there would be nothing of the world that Stan Lee created after that moment. So I went home and I said to Joni, you know, honey, I think I'd like to quit. 
I can see this job is a dead end. It's going to lead to nothing. I might as well leave now and try to find something else to do. And then the thing you're leading up to. Mm -hmm. She gave me the world's greatest advice. She said, why don't you do one book the way you want to do it? The worst that'll happen, he'll fire you, but you want to quit anyway. At least you'll have gotten it out of your system. Stan had several versions of the story about exactly how he and Joan met. Either his acquaintance arranged a date for him with another model girl, and when Joan opened the door, he couldn't take his eyes off her and asked her out. Or he had been drawing in his notebooks all his life the image of a single dream girl, like two drops of water, similar to Joan, and when one day a colleague at work saw those sketches, he said that he knew that girl and could introduce them. Nevertheless, their meeting made wow effect on Stan, and it lasted a lifetime. And there was this vision standing at the desk, who said, may I help you, with a voice that was music and a figure that was indescribable and a face that you couldn't believe. And I said, I love you. <laughs> Joan was a red-haired British woman, a beautiful model, bright, intelligent, with a sense of humor. And at the same time of their acquaintance, she was already married. It was a premature marriage to an American soldier during the Second World War. After a few days of acquaintance and after the newlyweds came to America together, very soon it turned out to be a mistake. But it was out of Stan's character to stop at something like someone else's marriage on the way to marrying the girl of his dreams, wasn't it? So he organized a flurry of activities, found out in which state Joan could get a divorce from her husband as soon as possible, and sent her to Reno, Nevada, flying in a few weeks later. On the same day, in December 1947, in the same office, the same judge granted Joan Clayton Bucock's divorce, and in the next office, he certified her marriage to Stan Lee. From that time, and for 70 years, they were inseparable. According to those who knew them, they perfectly complemented each other. Lee always shared all his thoughts and plans with his wife, and she always took an active part in all his ideas. In one of the early interviews, Lee said that it was Joan who inspired him to create more voluminous and complex characters who lived in real life and had the same problems as ordinary people, and that she was the inspiration for describing the love of Peter Parker's Spider-Man. But at the same time, Joan had her own separate life her own interests and did not demand that Lee, who as a typical creative person was immersed in his fantasies 24-7, constantly pay attention to her. She's the perfect wife for me because I spend so much time writing when I'm home and I imagine another woman might be saying things like, how come we never go anywhere? Why don't we take vacations? You never take me anywhere. But Joni, her house is her toy. She can always keep herself busy, which is wonderful for me so I don't feel guilty when I'm in my room writing. Of course, with his temperament and the wild nature of a fantasy master, one would hope that Lee's life in all his 95 years did not have any incidents involving other women, especially from the time of his youth when he was still making romances left and right, but then everything went into oblivion. Because his love for his wife, Joan Bukuk Lee, is something that generations will remember when they study Stan Lee's life and biography. In real life, he and Joan had only one daughter, but perhaps all of Stan's fantastic children should be considered Joan's children as well, because she not only supported him with the right word at an important moment, but also was the daily support thanks to which Stan could calmly devote himself to his projects. We also devote a lot of time to our projects in order to delight you with interesting stories. So subscribe to the channel and press the notification bell so you don't miss the release of new videos. For all the years that Stanley worked on the comic's creation, he not only published high quality and interesting pictures about superheroes, and not only made a real revolution in the very approach to creating these illustrated stories. All these years, brick by brick, he was building an incredible house, somewhere in a separate dimension in space, access to which was only open to the chosen ones, those whom he called true believers, whom he summoned to the general meetings of the initiates with a miraculous cry of Excelsior. The name of this special place is Marvel Universe. There, the stories were intertwined. The characters moved from one comic to another. New characters were first introduced by the creators in one of the episodes of the already existing comics as a kind of teaser with the aim of later getting their own separate comics. In this universe, readers were invited to co-author 
their opinions and advice were listened to, they were made participants in quests and awarded with fancy prizes, and this whole cycle was set in motion by Stan Lee, by the power of his indomitable desire for innovation and the search for new ways. The Marvel Bullpen This is the name Stan gave to that special environment to which everyone who was involved in the creation of Marvel Comics belonged. He invented this name somewhere in the late 60s when Marvel really began to transform from an ordinary comics publisher into a kind of community with its own principles, product vision, and the brightest comic artists of its time under its wing. In general, this approach to team building was also a measured scheme of cooperation for Lee, which he tried to implement in the newsroom since he first took over. A lot of the other books didn't even give credits. You never, they never mentioned who wrote it, who drew it. It was just a strip. Or sometimes they put the artist's name down. You know, the artist would just sign his name. That was it. But I tried to make it like a movie, I'd say. Um, and I tried to write the credits in a funny way so that the kids would read them. For example, um, written with passion by Stan Lee, drawn with, um, well, enthusiasm by Jack Kirby. Mm -hmm. Lettered with a scratchy pen point by Audie Simic. It was important to him that those who worked with him were not just a team of no-name comic creators hidden behind the scenes. He wanted everyone to work as equals and receive well-deserved recognition and to be known to the reader. So, when in the 60s, a certain permanent creative nucleus of Marvel was formed and received its name from the inventor Stan, it immediately received its direct path to the reader something like a newspaper that Lee called Marvel Bullpen Bulletins, which later became called simply Bullpen Bulletins, which was published from 1965 until 2001. And then I started a, um, a page called the Bullpen Bulletins page when I'd write announcements of things that were happening. And I wrote a column called Stan Soapbox, where I would philosophize about anything in the world, sometimes nothing to do with comics. And what happened was I became like the living symbol of Marvel Comics. I was the one guy everybody knew, and they thought I was talking to them. The, reader, the readers thought of me as a kindly old uncle, with, maybe with a sense of humor. The tone of Lee's newsletter was inspired by a series of adventure books for kids that he enjoyed reading as a child, where letters from readers were printed at the end of each book and the author's warm and formal responses to them. I don't know if I consciously remembered those books when I set out to do the bullpen page years later or if I was unconsciously influenced and only afterwards realized where I got the idea from. I do know that talking to the readers informally and indirectly seemed like the natural thing to do. That's how the direct communication of the Marvel creators with their readers began outside the pages of the comics. From the bullpen bulletin's pages, readers could learn not only about new projects that Marvel was working on, but also about changes and achievements in the lives of members of the creative team, about their personal lives, their tastes and views. With the creation of bullpen bulletins, Lee gave Marvel a living voice with which he began to communicate with his readers. Friendly, humorously, ironically, somewhat similar to how Stan communicated with his fans. Such a light and informal mixture of stand-up artist Lord Buckley and Austin Powers, it evoked sympathy, brought Marvel closer to its young audience, and was not at all similar to the tone used to communicate with the reader by the main competitor of Marvel, the editorial office of DC Comics, whose tone could be compared to that of arrogant adults. It was from the pages of the newsletter that Stan's apt words and phrases such as Excelsior, Nuff Said, True Believer, and Make Mine Marvel, which have already become iconic among fans of the Marvel Universe, flew into the world. From there came the famous nicknames of Lee and Kirby, Stan the Man Lee, and Jack King Kirby. Another Stan's invention, which has become an integral part of the Marvel Universe and its reliable link of communication with readers for decades, the strange and whimsical, the Marvel No Prize. As with any publication, errors were found in the pages of Marvel Comics, and there were readers so vigilant and avid that they didn't give them a single chance, drawing attention to them in their letters to the editor. And there were many of such readers. They were not too lazy to write to the editors and draw attention to what was wrong and in which issue. And then, while reading these letters, Stan had an idea. Why not encourage readers to follow Marvel Comics even more closely? Not to make them feel important to the editors, to feel that they too can contribute to the quality of their favorite comics. 
Of course, the publisher couldn't afford to give out real cash prizes to everyone who pointed out the mistakes, so Stan came up with this very strange prize that was unlike any other prize in the world. We would write the person's name and address on the envelope, and I'd have a little note going diagonally along the front of the envelope that would say, congratulations, you're another lucky no prize winner. <laughs> You'll find it enclosed and closed. They'd open it up, the envelope was empty. After a while, they realized that no prize means you don't get a prize. And it was very funny. The no prize was awarded to those readers who not only noted a mistake in the pages of the comics, but also came up with an apt explanation of how this mistake could be played around in the plot so that it would no longer be considered a mistake. Many devoted true believers still keep their no prize as prized heirlooms. Even after Stan Lee has moved forever from our reality to the dimension of the afterlife, his image, his voice, his unchanging glasses and sly smile will remain with us not only in his lifetime interviews and documentaries, we will always have his cameos as long as we watch and rewatch the movies that were made during his lifetime based on his creations. Although he, when creating his comics, did not even dream of such a thing. I never dreamt there'd be such a big movie. In those days, I was writing those books. I was hoping they'd sell so I wouldn't lose my job and I could keep paying the rent. All of a sudden, these characters have become world famous. They're the subject of blockbuster movies, and I'm lucky enough to get little cameos in them. Probably no person has had so many cameos of himself in movies and cartoons, TV series, and comics. Thus, by including in every film made about the characters and worlds created by Stan, his cameo was for the film studios as paying respect to the one-person embodiment of the entire Marvel Universe, his ambassador and inspiration. And he, with some purely childlike sincerity, enjoyed his unobtrusive participation in films, the ability to show off next to his superhero children in the form of cameos because he started acting in them at a rather advanced age, starting with the very first Iron Man in 2008 when he already turned 86. I just love doing cameos because, first of all, there's no real responsibility. By the end of his life, Stan Lee managed to appear in cameos in more than 20 films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or MCU, countless TV series, and all versions of Spider-Man, including Amazing Spider-Man and Sony Spider-Man, and two films of the Fantastic Four franchise from the Fox studio, six X-Men, and in many separate films such as Hulk and Daredevil. His favorite cameo was in 2016's X-Men Apocalypse because it featured Lee with his beloved Joan, who died a year before the film was released. Well, that cameo is different than any I ever have done before. What do you do? Because I did it with another person who is very important to me. Stan's last two cameos were in Venom, which came out a couple of months after Lee's death, and in Avengers Endgame, which came out a year after Stan's death in 2019. And what's your favorite Stan cameo? Share with us in the comments. In one of the stories about Lee, he was compared to an informant of the Watchers, characters from the world of comics, a race of observers whose main purpose is to collect information from all corners of known space and observe various civilizations. Why not compare Stan in all these movies to the Watcher? Stan Lee, on the edge of life, watches how his fantasies come true in another universe, the universe of cinema. Apparently, he is still watching all of us. Those who, one way or another, once discovered the world of his superhero children. With his trademark smile, squinting, he is happy that what he has been doing all his life is still alive, existing, developing and transforming, thus continuing his life. The life of Stan the Marvel Man. Excelsior. If you are interested in our story, we also talk about other famous and legendary personalities of modern pop culture. Click on the video that appeared on your screen and watch the news story together with the Biographer channel. We will be grateful for your like. Stay with us, because there are still a lot of interesting things ahead.